In return for, for giving a week of lectures earlier, um, Richard's paying me off by letting me put an ad in now for advanced graphics. So, so why do I want to tell you about advanced graphics? Well, because it's a fourth year course. Some of your students are already doing, are going to be here for three years, so if you want to do it, you've really got to do graphics in third year and advanced graphics in, in fourth year. And of course, it's the best course there is here. So, so what do you do? Well, whatever you want. This is why it's such a great course. So what students had to do this time was, um, let's pick one, come up with a project and do it. So there's one of the students, ah, things too small. What they're doing for drank here is that, bunch of data, work out how to do it, make it go really fast with graphics. Uh, another one's doing 3D landscape. That's, that's a real picture, that's the ideal. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be cool if we could do that. There's all, kind, that, that, doing that, there's all kinds of fun stuff in, in making it do that, so no pictures yet because they're all still working on it. But these are all the things that they're doing and pictures and ideas and they're all sort of putting up a log as they go. Um, here's another cool one for this year. Aha, uh -huh, it's your tutor, is it? Yeah, so you can actually go here and see what he's... He hasn't got any pictures, though. Anyway, he does have one. Oh, he had put them down there. The top, he has the photos at the top. Ah, the photo album. I knew it was here somewhere. All right, so still not too exciting because he's still got a way to go. And he's supposed to give a demo tonight, so we'll see how that goes. So <clears throat> that's, my main, that's my big ad for advanced graphics. The deal is you do a project involving graphics, you get to choose what it is. And of course, it's me giving you all the advanced stuff I'm talking about, well, all kinds of stuff in, where is it, back, lecture notes, stuff on fancy GLSL on particles and then physics and curves. And, all kinds of advanced graphic stuff, which everyone will be really interested in, especially if it's something you can use in your project to make something in graphics that looks really, really cool. So, because these projects were just partially completed, so they're not that impressive. So I persuaded Jose, who did Grant's Graphics last year, to come along and give you a demo of his project. So, yep, yeah, come up now. We're supposed to, we have to hook you up to the sound here. Yeah. You maybe clip that on your belt or put it in your pocket or something. Cool. And you clip that on there. Maybe just the pocket of your, yeah, that's cool. How do I get this to? The on switch. Uh, sorry, not experience. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, wrong button. There. Hey, it works. It's not my computer, actually. It's a um, CSE computer, so <laughs> it's dual boot. Um, OK, so quick introduction. Um, I'm a PhD student now, so I decided to do PhD. But this is my project for advanced graphics. Um, if it runs. You know, the thing is the window size is actually compiled into the code, so I can't actually change it here. But it's a ninja game. It may seem a bit too bright, but. Okay, you can see. Are you familiar with that logo? That's the CSC SOC logo, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I made that logo actually. But the thing is, um, sorry. Well, he's a ninja. Well, to be honest, okay. Um, the actual physics for the box is really hacky. I mean, I, w I mean, I was just concentrating much more on the graphics, but it's pretty hacky. You can actually get stuck into one of these boxes, but. The thing is, it's a really simple hack that lets you destroy the boxes and you can do things like grow the boxes. Okay, so you, if you ask what, what this project really is, it's actually a voxel editor. Do you guys, want, do you guys know what voxels are? Yes. Now with this thing, you can grow the pixels and you can destroy them. So it, it sort of comes like a voxel editor. You can make the CSC logo out of this. Um, 
if you're diligent enough, you can spend hours making the But that's not a point. Um, so what are things you can do? You can make the ninja dance. Wait, let me, yeah. <laughs> yes, Sparta moves. Um, apart from that, you can, you can look at the sky and make it, you can look at the ground. Do you guys know what HDR is? Yeah. Yes. This is a cheap ass version of HDR. It's, <laughs> it's, it runs on my really old graphics card because I don't have money to buy a good graphics card. But see, it's really bright, right? Slowly, if you keep looking into the sky, it actually slowly becomes darker and you can start to see the surroundings. Yeah, that's HDR. In a, well, it's not really HDR. This is the cheap version. OK, so this is my advanced graphics project. But what I really wanted to show you today is how I managed to turn this advanced graphic project into my thesis project. So um, if you, you guys know what you do in your thesis, um, you have 12 weeks now. So you have two semesters to do your thesis. In the first semester, you have to do the thesis A report. And the deadline of the thesis A report is win, in week 10, I think. And that's when you have no, to they decide. Changed they changed it? Yeah, week 7. Week 7? OK. Well, enjoy. You're going to have to. The thing is, um, with my thesis, right, I didn't know what to do for my thesis until week seven, when I came to him in week seven. And I decided to do this. I mean, I changed my thesis supervisor for like countless times. So without explaining what this is, this, I mean, you can see it's like, it's got the blooming thing. It's, it's using the similar code base with the previous um, Ninja thing I showed you. But this is a graph visualization system. So. Um, that's actually the, like, you, you, know, you know each node, right? Say it's Bugle 11, say it's MOOC 2. That actually represents a computer in the CSE undergraduate lab. And each of the lines here represent a 15 minute migration into another lab. So if you see a line from MOOC 2 to um, leave 02, that means in the year 2006, I think, this data is from 2006, um, there's been someone who migrated from that computer to another computer within 15 minutes. So log out, log in, I mean, and log in within 15 minutes. I got this data from site office, not, I mean system support, and you can show a lot more in it. You can see, I mean, back then it was just lines, right? You can see things like, um, you can see things like the migration length. There's a computer in MOOC, yeah, this one. No, this one, it's gotta be this one. You see why there's so, many, so much migration from MOOC 9 to MOOC 10? I think you guys now have the lab, um, the Mac computers there, right? Before you, we used to have an IBM computer on these computers. And the, lab, and the screen was screwed up on MOOC 9. Whenever it showed black, it would display green instead. And so I'm guessing that's where the stuff came from. So if you guys can't guess yet, this is, my thesis is um, visualization of social networks. So basically, all this data, you, OK, you can get data anywhere. But visualizing them allows you to look at data in a new 3D way. In a funky way, I guess. Um, you can do things like, let's see, usages. If you change the usages, you can, can set the positions of the labs to reflect the amount of usage. So the higher they are, the, the more used they are. So the computers that has least amount of hours of usage would be the booking computers and some other computers. But it's because you log into a booking computer, you've got five minute, you've got five minute limit. But the most, look, look, uh, the most used computers will be this one. No, this one. One of them. But you can split them into the hours. So this is um, 0 AM, 1 AM, 2 AM, 3 AM, 4 AM. If you, see, if you go up to 7 AM in the morning, you start to see people coming in. But here's the interesting thing you can find in the data. At, at around um, 4 AM, 5 AM, 6 AM, 7 a.m. There's this computer that's been used a lot. <laughs> like this single computer, you don't know why. And 8 a.m., 9 a.m. Gets even more until 12 o'clock at night. So, okay, these two computers. <laughs> so that's, that's not very far away, right? Um, try to figure out why it was so popular. But turns out that, you know, in Spoon, this is a computer where you walk in from one door and then you walk out from the other door. You can't see someone there in the computer at all. So <laughs> the theory is he's probably playing Quake somewhere. <laughs> It was pretty popular last year. Um, I guess that's what you, again, you can see other stuff, but I want to show you a different set of data. This is the CSC academics. You know, you know those um, 
CSE Academics you find at CSE. They make publications, and by finding out who, do, who does publications with who, you can find out who's friends with who. I can't actually, I'm not actually allowed to show you the usernames, so. Oh, no, it's the node label. Yeah, I'm not allowed to show you the usernames because, well, I can tell you that this is the head of school. Because <laughs> um, he grew by office location, and there's only one person in level one that's the head of school. Then there's people in level two, level three, level four, level five. Um, we'll group them by the, so I've just made them go to their levels. So that's level five. This is their CSE office levels, by the way. I can tell you, I can tell you that this is the software engineering island. Um, one of them, who does software engineering here? How many of you? Who, who knows, um, you've got, you guys know Ken, right? No. Nah? Yeah. Yes? Um, he's one of those people here, so. Um, I think, this will be the, I'll just tell you quickly about the CSE research structure. Most of them, a lot of them are doing AI and visual. I mean, the blue, the level four people will be doing mostly AI and knowledge representation. Is that true? Yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah, AI and stuff like that. Level three will be mostly robotics people because that's where the robotics lab is. Level four, level five, not too sure, but level five or level six. But level six is pretty close together. So. Mm, actually, gee, so if you can, you can see that level six people are actually pretty close together. Anyways, um, this is actually, uh, this console system is actually in, inspired by Quake. <laughs> uh, one fifty point oh. Well, you know, in Quake you can do that, right? I mean. So you can zoom and do stuff like that. Okay, the last thing I want to show you before, before I go into other stuff is, um, no, it's just, it's just game. Okay. All right, this is not meant to scare you about your final year complexity of theses. I'm gonna show you the code structure of my, my thesis. Basically, um, what I've done with my thesis, right, I've, I've put a back, well, I'll call it a backdoor. Basically, you know how there's um, I've implemented a programming language for this, basically a scripting language. I've made it so that you can listen to outside connections, and basically, and with that, you can have any program and you can send it any kind of data you want. So, a little thing I've made, but open server one three seven hmm, xds mds localhost one three seven. I hope this works. <laughs> Okay, it's sending in the structure. This is a um, directory structure and the file structure. And you know with C and C++ files, you can include other files. It's gonna show the structure of includes and excludes. Okay, this might, this might look like a lot of files, but trust me, this, each of these files are pretty small. I'm, I'm trying not to scare you here, but, and a lot of these, this is not just a semester's work, worth of work. I recycled a lot of my second year and third year coding stuff. See, code reuse. Um, like for example, this try.c++, I think I got this file from um, third year? Yeah, it's a third year um, try library. Do you guys know what a try is? Yes? No, no one knows? No, most of them don't, so you okay. should tell them. Okay, a try is, um, do you guys know what I'm, no, okay. Actually, I'm not gonna turn this into a data organization course and lecture. Okay, it, now here's the thing about this. It might look complicated, but if you group them, they look much neater. There you go. So if you saw my code and think, you think it might be a nightmare to maintain it, this is actually the include um, directives. So it's not, it doesn't really, reflect, doesn't really reflect how my code is structured because sometimes you want to include this code and this code includes that other code. You have to, well, it's basically a result of my laziness from years maintaining my code. But um, this is the easiest thing for me to implement. I mean, I was about to, I was thinking of making something that looks at your code structure and see which function calls which function and visualize that. 
which will be pretty useful. So you can see which, which functions are the most used in your code, and maybe you can optimize that. But I mean, I'll have to write a C parser for that. So. Um, you understand you're already out C parsers. Sorry? This was the thing I kept telling him during, during his thesis. You don't have to write your own language or your own parser. I, re I recycled that for my third year, so <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, um, I think that's about it that I can show you for today. Okay. There's other data about monkeys. Yeah. This is monkey domination data. So this is the monkey at the top. This, all the arrows means that they win most of their food fights against other monkeys. I got this data from some researcher in the the US send me this. So yeah, can do other stuff. One interesting thing with this thing is um, if you look at the group domination of the bottom group, just research view, each of the color represents their lineage. So same color means they're related somehow in blood. But um, if you look at this, right, the, uh, fam the families maintain a nearly strict order of, well, I'd call it ownage, but um, <laughs> I mean, like the blue monkeys don't lose at all to the yellow monkeys. Like if you just see the yellow monkeys doesn't win against any of the blue monkeys. And the blue monkeys doesn't, I mean the blue monkeys doesn't only win sometimes against the green monkeys. But the green monkeys does not win at all against the red monkeys. So, so the red monkeys dominate all. So yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all I can show you. I don't have much else to say. Um, one thing I want to tell you about is, um, can I talk to you about the Valhalla project? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I've got to yeah. put it up for you. Have you guys seen those Car Carnegie Mellon University videos on YouTube where they have this funky stuff on video, on, on a screen? Um, you have to go to recent changes. And they have these, um, they have funky implementers and they put in YouTube videos and they advertise it to all the other unis, right? I mean. Sounds cool, but the thing is, USW, we have robotic stuff, but we want to, it would be nice if we have something that can compete against that or even beat them in that case. So, what we're thinking of, I think. Yeah. So, which one? Yeah, just all of them. Um, the multi, no, the 3D. This one? Yeah, head tracking. I'm pretty sure a bunch of you have seen this before. Who's seen this before? Yeah, it's pretty well, Not fun. everyone, so it's worthwhile. Uh, yeah. Hi, my name is Johnny Lee. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to perform head tracking and create desktop virtual reality displays using the Nintendo Wii Remote. Now, first, what do I mean by a desktop VR display? Well, when you think about most computer screens, they're typically used to display a flat image, a little bit like this picture in the picture frame. Even if the picture is of something 3D, uh, like a video game, the picture is still flat. So there's a change depending on what angle you view the screen at. A desktop VR display, however, is a little bit like taking the picture out of the picture frame and then just having the frame. Now the scene actually changes depending on what angle I view the screen at. So this essentially becomes a portal or a little window into another room. Now to do this, the computer needs to know the location of your head relative to the screen. And this is called head tracking. Now to perform head tracking, we're going to be using the Wii Remote and the sensor bar. But we're actually going to be using them backwards. We're going to put the Wii Remote next to the TV and actually move the sensor bar instead. The Wii Remote actually contains an infrared camera, and the sensor bar is simply two sources of infrared light. When the camera sees the two dots of light, it's going to give an approximate location of my head horizontally, vertically, and in distance from the screen. Okay, the tricky part is, now we're going to have to find some way to mount the sensor bar onto our head. One common trick is to get a baseball cap, and then mount the hardware to the cap. And this is definitely going to work, but it's a little bit goofy. So instead, some hardware stores sell these safety glasses with LEDs built in on the side, meant to be used as headlamps. Now if you replace the LEDs with infrared ones, you essentially get your head mounted sensor bar and a nice, sporty, safety goggle form factor. <laughs> Once we've created our head-mounted sensor bar, and I've connected my Wii Remote to my PC, we're ready to do some head tracking. Behind me is a demo program of a 3D room with some targets floating in it. 
Now, because the effect only works for the person wearing the sensor bar, I'm going to have to show you the effect through a moving camera. Now, to do this, I'm literally just going to hold the sensor bar at the base of the camera and move it around. Just a quick note, to power the sensor bar, I simply turn on my Wii after I've connected my Wii remote to my PC. First, I'm going to show you what it looks like without head tracking, which is what displays normally look like. You can see that although it's a picture of a 3D room, the image looks very two-dimensional and bound to the surface of the TV. Now, with head tracking turned on, the TV actually looks like the entrance to a real room. Just like in real life, by moving our head around, we can look behind objects. And if you look really closely, some targets actually appear to be floating out in front of the screen, reaching into the real world. If we get closer to the screen, we get closer to the objects, and we can even get behind the ones floating in front of the screen. As I pull the camera back, keep an eye on the frontmost target. Head tracking provides the illusion that the target is actually floating directly above the laptop screen, far in front of the TV. <laughs> now using this picture of a football stadium, if you move right, you can see more of the field. If you move left, you can see more of the stands. And if you get closer to the screen, you see more of everything, just like a real window. If I use my IR glasses and keep the sensor bar on the TV, I can use a second Wii remote to point and shoot like any Wii game while also doing head tracking. So now ducking and shifting your body is actually meaningful to a game. You can also see now uh, how the perspective is incorrect if you are not the one wearing glasses. So head tracking for VR displays is only going to work for one person at a time. But for that one person, the 3D experience is going to be far more realistic and immersive than anything else we see in homes today. So if you're watching this and you're a Nintendo Wii game developer, I'm going to see some games. <laughs> anyway, as usual, you can visit my website to download this software and find out more information about my other Wiimote projects. Thanks for watching. So. So, um, with the Wiimote, you can... Hello, hello. Does it actually sound? No, no, that's just for the... Oh, cool. All right. Um, with, the meme, with the Wii mode, you can actually um, do a lot of stuff. There's other videos that shows you how to do multi-touch whiteboards. He actually does this like real-time real drawing with, with his hands by touching um, infrared, infrared lights on his hands. Um, the point is, we're actually um, thinking of supervising some students. Yeah. OK. All right. So the reason why we showed you this, this video is that Jose is um, doing his PhD thesis. He's taken his uh, fourth year project and he's turning it into a PhD. And we want to do some other, some, one thing he's realized is it's really awkward to navigate through this, this, these visualizations and manipulate them just using a mouse. So. We want to do some stuff with uh, other ways of doing it, with you know, well, mouseless mouses or head tracking, all kinds of cool stuff to to, to work with them. And rather than do it all himself, because he's supposed to be concentrating on other things for his PhD, it's a really good thing for um, undergraduate students to do. You'll be my slaves. Yes, you'll be his slaves. But um, even at the end, we have several ways of doing this. In particular. You could do it as, where's the top thing here? Here we go. There's um, a couple of courses you can do if you don't want to wait till fourth year to do a thesis. You can actually do special projects, which is uh, like six units of credit or 12 units of credit, where instead of doing a normal course, you do like a small thesis. You do some sort of research project. We also have this cool thing over summer called Taste of Summer, where, no, it's Taste of Research, isn't it? Taste of Summer. Anyway, yes. we've got the name wrong. We have a thing called Taste of Research, where over the summer break between um, session two and session one, you work, we have scholarships. It's not that much, but it's a lot better than nothing. And more importantly, you get to work on a small research project and have fun. So if you're a really good student, you could think of possibly doing something like that this summer 
or at the end of your first year or possibly the end of the second year. Um, I'll put some links up to the ideas here from the 1917 page and we just want to, hey, think about it. If you're really good at computing and you really enjoyed your, um, what are you, what's your assignment now? It's the AI one, is it? <laughs> what, what are you doing in AI for? Like card game. Yes. For some card game like Big Two, I think. It's called Black Adder, I think. Is it Black, Black Adder? Adder? It's called Baldrick. Oh, that's ominous. <laughs> okay. Um, but it is a lot of fun um, doing research. It's also very frustrating. But you end up doing something new. Someone's no one ever done before. Whereas doing an assignment, you've done, you're doing the same thing as everything else. Um, what are we doing for time? I'll just show you. Yeah, well, all right. I'll just show a bit more from advanced graphics this session. What do we got? Assignments. Uh, the assignment. I gave him an assignment to do flat burning things, because that's always fun. And... I won't, don't have time for a demo, but that's the sort of thing they were doing for their first assignment for advanced graphics. That's done with, uh, well, they were done two different ways. The way you do flames on computer graphics is what's called a particle system. That is, if you think about what a flame really is, it's just a lot of gas molecules getting heated up, burning, getting really hot, and then they're rising up and as they cool down, they change colour. All right, and then you have, for example, wind and atmospheric effects. So the simplest way to simulate that on a computer is to have what's called a lot of particles. So you just have um, a X, Y, Z, position, velocity, colour, say, of a whole bunch of particles, and you apply some simple physics so that they all move up and cool down. And the fun thing about this assignment to make it interesting for them was that um, most modern computers these days on your graphics card have a very powerful set of processors on the GPU. And they have things called shaders, which are actually programs that run on your graphics card. And the, and the fun thing is your graphics card usually these days has actually more processing power than your CPU. On the other hand, it's got more power, but it's much more limited because it has multiple processors. Um, modern ones have like 128 different processors on them. Each one of them isn't as powerful as your CPU, but together, they're much more powerful. But the disadvantage is that they're harder to program because you've got to convince all these different processes to work together. Particle systems are nice for that because each particle you can do the calculations for separately. So it's very easy to divide it up amongst a whole bunch of processes. So what students did for this assignment was make flames, do it both on the CPU and GPU, and see which is faster. And the answer was, um, which was faster? Yeah. I can't even read that. GPU, turned out the CPU was faster. <laughs> Until it got to a million particles and then the GPU won. So. And other people did other flames. Where is um, Rob's? Oh, no, I know. Um, anyone have any of these people as their tutor? We just saw Glenn's, right? OK, he was going to. I was trying to persuade him to come and give a demo, but he said, oh, my students will be there, and they won't. So there's, there's um, another one, different sort of flame they got. All right, um, any questions? Yes? Shh, quiet, please. Um, you think about a, a six-unit uh, special project, eh? <laughs> um, usually not till second year. Well, okay, but they're first years. So, in theory, you could do it in first year if you were able to persuade somebody, um, a lecturer, to supervise that project. If you could convince them that, hey, yeah, I'm so good in my first year, I can do a research project. If you're able to persuade someone, then yes, you can do it in first year. Generally, students wait till second year before they start doing those. Yeah? Yeah, that's second year. That, that's, I don't know, maybe that's because I'm doing computer engineering, but 
No, the normal thing for a special project is students can do it in second year, but we don't. It, yeah, because the number is 3901, that suggests that it's normally a third year one, but if you're really keen and want to got an idea or you want to get do some of this stuff, because it is a lot of fun, it is possible to do it in second year. Is that it, there is no actual rule against doing it in first year, but you'll have trouble persuading someone to, to supervise you. Yes? Uh, everyone else could be quiet, please. Which, which demo? The flames, or the ninja, or the graph? The graph one, yeah. So just for anyone who didn't hear that, he used OpenGL and SDL. SDL is a system for handling input and, um, yeah. Why didn't we use DirectX? <laughs> Um, DirectX only works under Windows, so it's, it's, it doesn't, I mean, it, it doesn't really have any other advantages other than, um, the other thing is Direct3D, which is the, which is the graphics part of DirectX, Microsoft tend to throw every latest thing that come out from graphics cards into it so that it can be really cutting edge and everything, but the result is that if you want to try programming in it, it's, it's, it's much uglier than OpenGL. So if you really want to be absolutely getting the very latest piece of hardware that just came out, then OK, DirectX has an advantage. But because it goes through versions much more quickly than OpenGL, the actual using it is it's not as pleasant. So yeah, the, the performance really isn't much difference because um, it's really your graphics hardware that, that control the speed, unless there's some major deficiency in the way it goes. Other questions? Yes? Uh, quiet. Shh. Everyone else could be quiet so we can hear what he's saying. Yeah. Have you, don't need to point it out, but have you considered actually using geographical methods for locating these nodes? Well, you're talking, you want to ask him. Yes, sorry. So, use geographical methods for locating nodes where geographical <laughs> Just hack into their computers and take it, no problem. Yeah, it's, it's actually quite hard to get that data because they, they want to protect the privacy of the people. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, thanks very much. If you've got any more questions, you can come and talk to either of us after the lecture. So, um, thanks for your time.